So I speak to you today as a robust cultural pluralist and as an anthropological observer of prophecies. And I plan to describe three prophecies about the shape of the emerging new world order as it relates to cultural diversity. Um, with regard to robust cultural pluralists, let me first of all say by the robustness I mean it goes beyond appreciating other people's costumes and cuisines. We're talking about robust cultural pluralism in the sense of seeing whether or not you can make space for the kinds of cultural diversity that anthropologists have been documenting on a worldwide scale for a well over a century. Um, There's a maxim that I'll announce, which is one of the principles of a philosophy of life and a philosophy of scholarship that I call Confusionism. Not to be confused with Confucianism. I don't mean Confucianism, I mean Confusionism. And the, the central principle of the philosophy of Confucianism is the following. The knowable world is incomplete if seen from any one point of view. Incoherent if seen from all points of view at once. And empty if you try to see it from nowhere in particular. That is, if you try to assume a deep structural approach and have this kind of dehumanizing distance on everything in which all truth is re reduced to a mathematical formula. So the choice in life, according to Confucianism, is between emptiness, is be, yeah, it's, it's be, incompleteness, incoherence, and emptiness. That's your choice in life. Uh, it may sound like a tragic choice, and there is a tragic element to being embodied, being situated, and living in a world in which the knowable world is incomplete, if seen from any one point of view, incoherent, if seen from all points of view at once, and empty, if seen from nowhere in particular. So given that choice between incompleteness, incoherence, and emptiness, I can never choose incompleteness. I'm sorry, I can never choose incoherence because, of course, that would be the end of all intelligible conversation. Emptiness seems like it is too far distanced from lived realities. So I always choose incompleteness and then try to stay on the move between different points of view. And that's what I'm going to try and do today. I also should tell you that there was a public service advertisement that showed up on television in the early days of television in New York City where I grew up as a young person in the early 1950s. A jingle appeared and with cartoon figures that went like this. George Washington loved good roast beef. <laughs> Heim Solomon, Heim Solomon was a Jewish banker who helped finance the American Revolution and was a friend of George Washington. So George Washington loved good roast beef. Heim Solomon loved fish. When Uncle Sam served liberty, they both enjoyed the dish. <laughs> so that was a kind of advertisement for tolerance of diversity and for different choices people make. And I suspect it's one of the several reasons I became a cultural anthropologist, because I found myself over the decades thinking about that jingle and substituting other things into it. How about George Washington liked polygamy and Heim Solomon loved monogamy. Um, you can think of all the cultural practices that might have been different choices. And when Uncle Sam served liberty, did he make space for those diverse practices? The thought experiment that I engage in is to try and pick up all the diversity that anthropologists have studied genuine, robust, traditional forms and move them into one domestic sphere. I happen to be thinking a lot about the United States and how much scope can there be for genuine cultural diversity in a liberal democracy such as the United States. But it's a question you can ask in any country. In the United States, in the face of immigration and globalization, there's, there has certainly been many occasions in which people who thought they were tolerant pluralists have all of a sudden discovered people living in their communities doing things they don't like. Okay. Like animal sacrifice all of a sudden appears in a local religious organization. Farmers start growing 
animals for animal sacrifice in the United States. Is this acceptable within our legal and moral traditions or isn't it? You can ask this of all sorts of practices and customs. What are the boundaries? What are the limits on tolerance? And is it possible to have a big tent view of the possibilities for diversity? So that's the kind of question that I've been asking. But I'm going to try and deal with this on the global scale today. So November 9th, 1989 is the day the Berlin Wall came tumbling down. And the Cold War balance of power shifted dramatically in favor of the United States, at least in 1989. The United States being a country which has long viewed itself as exceptional, and the phrase American exceptionalism gets brought up in conversations and contexts all the time. Um, this is a nation, the United States, where something that might be called constitutional patriotism defines you as an American rather than any particular race or religion or ethnic background. It's a place where, at least in the ideal of some people, everyone is a hyphenated American. And that includes those Anglo-Protestants who came long ago. They, too, are hyphenated Americans, not the true and real Americans, with everyone else being hyphenated. This is very different than the situation in many European countries, in which the tradition has been much more ethno-national. And for example, Danes, who are Think of the, Dan of the Danish ethnic group, think of Denmark as a place where the government is there to perpetuate the Danish people's way of life. And so when Turks or Moroccans move into Denmark, they might be the hyphenated Danes, but the real Danes are the real Danes, not hyphenated. This is less true in the United States, which is much more multicultural historically than many European countries, which have been much more culturally homogeneous and are now faced with all sorts of difficulties um, due to in-migration, due to refugees, and other kinds of, of uh, cultural differences which have emerged. But it's not absent as a problem in the United States either. In any case, if you kept your ears to the ground in those heady days just after the wall came down, you would have repeatedly heard one particular kind of prophecy about the shape of the new world order that was expected to emerge to replace the old tripartite division, which was common, at least in conversations in the United States, between the first world, the second world, and the third world. The whole world was divided up into a tripartite scheme. The first world being the capitalist world, the second world being the communist world, and the third world being the quote unquote underdeveloped world. Okay. Uh, and, and you often had those in the third world competing for resources from the, the first and the second world who were in competition with each other for allegiances and loyalties. It was a pr prophecy premised on an expansive view of globalization. And the prediction went like this. And here I'm quoting what is probably the most widely quoted and famous line from Francis Fukuyama's book, The End of History and the Last Man. And the prophecy, quoting Fukuyama, is this, quote, what we may be witnessing is not just the end of the Cold War or the passing of a particular period of post-war history, but the end of history as such. That is, the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. That was perhaps the most common augury or prediction about the New World Order during the 1990s. It was even called, still is called, the Washington Consensus, and it remains a very popular expectation even today, even as current world tensions between West and East, or between various liberal democratic states and more autocratic or theocratic states, have led at least one leading political realist, someone named Robert Kagan, to title a relatively recent book, The Return of History and the End of Dreams, because um, he's reacting against this prediction, which he thought was pure 
utopian nonsense. In any case, for many prognosticators, especially those who were either triumphant Americans or non-American admirers of the United States, that type of the West is best and is going to take over the world prediction, rich in assumptions about cultural and moral superiority, was really a thinly veiled expression of the assumption that the American way of life is best and should and will be universalized. The notion that we had possibly reached, quote unquote, an end point to mankind's ideological evolution expressed their expectation of a global convergence of beliefs, values, and cultural practices in the direction of the American standard, whatever that standard might be. And that expectation condensed and articulated a view dating to at least the 18th century Enlightenment figures such as Voltaire and Condorcet, that the history of the world marches in the direction of an ideal universal civilization or some objective moral charter, and that at any moment one nation, perhaps England in the 19th century, and then another, perhaps America in the second half of the 20th century, comes closest to realizing that progressive goal or end of history. Okay. This project was and is known as the civilizing project. It's a notion that went out of favor in my own discipline of American anthropology in the late 19th century and early 20th century when certain anthropologists like Franz Boas and other cultural pluralists criticized what they thought of as an inaccurate and utopian view of a unilineal course of global evolution for cultures. But even if it went out in my own discipline in the late 19th and early 20th century, it's back. And it's back big and strong, and there are a lot of people who buy into it. In its most triumphal form, the prediction amounts to the claim that American civilization is the greatest flowering or the most fully realized expression of the only true global civilization, and that American cultural designs for social, political, legal, economic, and family life, and for marriage, gender equality, and the raising and educating of children as citizens in a liberal polity are so superior that they will be recognized as such by people all over the world um, and will diffuse over the entire globe. Well, it's an ecumenical ideal that liberal secular humanists and many human rights activists have found appealing and associate with the very idea of modernity. It is a vision that I think inspires some people to even imagine that one day there will be laws without nations, just an international court, and everyone will be liberated individual citizens of the world and national attachments will disappear. There won't be in-groups and out-groups. There'll just be global citizenship. Here I want to pause for a moment to more concretely illustrate the character of this first prediction that the West is best and will take over the world. For starters, consider the events at two World Bank meetings that I attended towards the end of the last millennium. The first called Culture Counts. This was held in October of 1999. And the second on the topic of gender and justice in Africa, which was held in May of 2000. Culture Counts was a large international gathering held in Florence, Italy. It included talks by ministers of finance or culture or education from around the globe. Hillary Clinton was on the program back then. But the real highlight was the plenary academic session, which featured a keynote address by a prominent American economic historian. Given that the millennium was fast approaching, he reported on the last 1,000 years of what he presumed to be the universal race among nations to be successful, by which he meant to become as rich as possible. And he explained why the primordial national inheritance or cultural inheritance of the people 
makes all the difference for whether a territory is rich or poor. All right, so get ready for this. <laughs> this was the somewhat astonishing speech that he gave at the World Bank. He said, China was probably leading the race 1,000 years ago. But they inherited too many xenophobic beliefs from their ancestors and didn't want to trade with outsiders. So the Chinese fell behind and didn't get a ship into the Atlantic Ocean until well into the 19th century. Of course, China seems to be trading with outsiders rather successfully today. So how deep this claim to cultural inheritance was probably is highly debatable. Nevertheless, this was the provocative opening given at this, at this uh, World Bank meeting. The keynote speaker then took the audience on an economic and cultural tour of the rest of the world. Culture counts everywhere, he said. In Latin America, they have this attitude called machismo, so Latin men think they are little princes and don't want to work. <laughs> In Africa, okay, yes, the physical environment is not very good, but they fight with each other all the time and they beat their wives. And then there is Southern Europe and Catholicism. The Catholic Church turned against Galileo and science. So Southern Europeans fell into ignorance and superstition. But now we have reached the year 2000. This is, of course, given 12 years ago. Look around. North Americans and Northern Europeans have won the race and for good cultural reasons, the American exclaimed, even before he could fully deliver his take-home message, which was, get with the progressive program, westernize your culture, model yourself after us, or remain poor. Several delegates at the meeting had walked out of the room. The second meeting on gender and justice in Africa was held at World Bank Central in Washington, D.C., with occasional satellite links to audiences in six African countries. This was my first experience with a really high-tech event, because I was sitting on a podium with one other speaker and a chair, and there were six television screens where we could see in six African countries people sitting around seminar tables who were listening to us and were going to ask questions of us, as well as an audience right in front of us. In any case, at this meeting, on the podium with me, a prominent Western liberal feminist who believed that the ideal of progressive social evolution and the end of history required that the sisters of the world transcend their primordial ethnic group identities and religious and national attachments and unite in opposition to a loathsome and oppressive universal patriarchy, delivered the following message to a predominantly African female audience. This is what she said. And you're familiar with Burka, the Burka controversy, I suppose, in France and in other places. But this is what this prominent Western liberal feminist said. She said, stop complaining about colonialism. African traditions and customs were bad for women long before colonialism came along. She then invoked a sensational literary account of, of all things, wife beating, which she took to be a cultural tradition in Africa. As it turned out, the sisters in the audience were mainly united in opposition to what they perceived as the speaker's Anglo-Protestant neo-colonial attitudes and all too familiar and high-minded first world missionary zeal. They certainly had some complaints about their men. I had been listening to them for two days prior to this session, but they still viewed them as members of the family and generally felt at home with them in their distinctive national traditions. And they actually thought African fe females were pretty powerful in their own way. Okay. Even Americans who take up veiling or headscarves, for example, actually perceive themselves as empowering themselves when they do this. And many of them feel rather happy to no longer be visible to the male gaze. They think they're taken seriously rather than treated as sexual objects. But the meeting that was most revealing of the type of story I have in mind, of history ending with the apotheosis of the beliefs, values, and cultural practices of a universal Western civilization, 
was a third meeting, which was held in April of 1999 at the House of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, sponsored by Harvard University's Academy for International and Area Studies, and organized by Samuel Huntington and Lawrence Harrison. I'll come back to Samuel Huntington's prophecies in a moment. A notable theme at that meeting was the general equation of progress and goodness with Anglo-Protestant values. One of the organizers suggested that Protestant missionary efforts in Latin America might enhance economic growth with the implication that the more Catholics who are converted to Northern European ways, the better. Others argued that Jews and overseas Chinese are good for the economy too, especially if they behave like Protestants or at least subscribe to some version of the Protestant ethical law that only those who accumulate wealth have been chosen by God to be saved. The most dominant theme at the meeting, however, was the emphasis on progressive national development so as to make the world a better place. Here there was a good deal of discussion of the imperial Anglo-Protestant civilizing project. Um, this project, by the way, is known by many names, but back in India, I happen to study India a lot, I've worked in India for several decades, but if you go back in Indian history, you will find that there was a period in Indian history in the early days of the East India Company um, where people like Hastings and Jones came there and created the Asia Society of Bengal, which was dedicated to learning local languages. They quickly discovered that India had diverse populations and that there were Muslims and Hindus living there. And their view was that Muslims should live by Quranic law, Hindus should live by the Dharma Shastra or Hindu religious law, Eng the English who were there should live by English common law, and there was no attempt to try and create a single legal system that everyone must abide by. There wasn't a notion of the normal family that everyone should have. There was a kind of acceptance and interest in documenting cultural diversity. This was followed by a later phase in which Thomas Macaulay, who was the head of the East India Company at some point, we're talking about the 1830s, created an educational system in India, which was very much a British educational system, and his goal, explicitly, in his own words, was to create dark-skinned Englishmen. The goal of the educational system was to have a class or an elite who were as English, if not more English than the English, in all sorts of ways, in their attitudes, in their use of the English language, um, in their values. The only difference would be their ancestry. For him, that was un unimportant compared to bringing the benefits of British civilization to the elites that would be created through the educational system. And so this kind of project was started long ago. It was aimed at establishing that the West, or at least the northernmost sectors of the West are best, and in improving the rest of the world through exposure to Northern European and American values, beliefs, and customs. It would appear to be a sign of the times that the conference publication that I'm talking, the, from the conference I'm talking about, a book called Culture Matters, How Values Shape Human Progress, became a media event. And you might, if you're interested in this topic, have a look at this book called Culture Matters. The book was reviewed in the Wall Street Journal and Time Magazine and discussed in the New York Times and the Atlantic Monthly. For a short period of time, it was one of the top 800 best-selling books at Amazon.com, which is a stunning achievement for an edited academic volume. I was invited to the Culture Matters conference to fill the role of a designated skeptic. I actually was called up by the conference organizers, and I was told they wanted to have a couple of designated skeptics, so they were going to invite me as a designated skeptic because they thought I believed in culture, but not in progress. <laughs> and they also were going to invite another designated skeptic, who ended up being Jeffrey Sachs, the economist. And they were inviting him because they thought um, uh, he believed in progress, but not in culture. 
<laughs> so we were going to be the designated skeptics. In any case, I found myself, I, pl I played that part to some extent, but I also found myself asking, is this how the famous Franz Boas, the founder of American anthropology and other robust cultural pluralists, felt 100 years ago debating with liberal, progressive, European Enlightenment-inspired cultural evolutionary theorists in an earlier heyday of Western-initiated globalization. And if you go back to the 1870 to 1914 period, prior to World War I, I think you will find, if you look carefully, that the world looked in many ways very much like it has looked for the last 40 or 50 years as globalization has returned to the world. This is not, something that almost looks like a pendulum swing. In the 1870 to 1914 period, there was an enormous amount of labor migration, immigration, lots of investment of capital in foreign countries, tariffs were, came down, globalization and internationalism was very popular, and of course it all came to a crashing end with World War I, in which borders went up, we no longer had the free flow of everything across borders, quite the contrary. The world went into a long period, at least in the United States, up until the mid-1960s, when all of a sudden immigration was made easier, and all of a sudden we started talking about borderless capitalism, again, not for the first time. 1870 to 1914 is an interesting analog to today. In any case, I found myself at this conference wondering what happened to the robust, robust cultural pluralism message of Anthropology 101, which is the number given to introductory anthropology in the United States. In other words, I came face to face with the utter failure of my own discipline of cultural anthropology to accomplish its most basic mission, to raise questions amongst, and, and to raise awareness and questions among social scientists, policy analysts, and the public at large about the diverse virtue in the diversity of nations and to the hazards of any universal civilization ideal, whether it's Christian or Muslim or Hindu or secular in its ideological origins. And I found myself acutely aware of the responsibility of anthropologists political scientists and globalization theorists to take up what I think of as a certain challenge that I associate with a very famous American anthropologist, Clifford Gertz, namely to develop and promote a conception of the relationship between a cultural community and a political community that might be useful in minimizing some of the risks associated with the problem of primordial group differences and with multinational life in a global and migratory world. So let me, that's the first prophecy. The West is best, it's going to take over the world. There's an objective moral charter that defines the universal global civilization. At each point in history, some nation is furthest along in realizing that objective moral charter, and other nations, if given the opportunity, will embrace it once they realize how superior it is. That's prediction number one. Let me move to the second prediction. First, let me say that, um, and the second prediction basically says, civilizations are local, not universal. Okay. Um, as far as I know, the true connection between globalization narrowly conceived, and when I think of globalization narrowly conceived, I think of it as meaning free trade, period and globalization expansively conceived, which is the idea of Western values, culture, and institutions taking over the world, the relationship um, it, between those two, I think, has yet to be firmly established. Let me say something more about globalization narrowly conceived. There are some classic anthropological accounts of trade in the Pacific Islands, um, the Western Pacific. And the picture I have of the narrowest kind of globalization or free trade is people on one island know that people on another island who are of a totally different cultural group make something they like and vice versa. And so they row over to a beachhead on another island and they leave the things they make 
on the beachhead where they find the things that the other people make waiting for them to take. And over some period of time, they actually have established an equilibrium state in which they understand the value, the exchange value of doing this. They never even talk to each other. Just the goods are left and the goods are found and this goes on. Nobody asks, what religion do those people practice? No one says, what kind of families do they have? No one says, do they share my view of gender relations? Okay. How do they bring up their children? Okay. Do they use physical punishment? You know, what's the division of labor? None of those questions are asked. They just look at the product they made, they like it, they like each other's products, and they exchange. They don't want to know too much about the other, and they certainly don't presume they can tell, they can have an economic embargo in which they say, unless you change this in your society, we won't trade with you. Okay. That is narrow definition of globalization. And you can see how the notion can be like an accordion. You can make it bigger and bigger and bigger. And ultimately, globalization takes on a very expansive view. In any case, I believe it's quite possible that other cultures and civilizations do not need to become just like the United States to benefit <coughs> materially from participation in an emergent, narrowly conceptualized global economy. And that's part of what the second prediction is about. Modern technologies like television, cell phones, computers, weapons, and modern economic institutions like investment vehicles, private property, seem to have effectively served many interests, including the interests of primordial communitarians and religious fundamentalists all over the world. If you think about the Iranian Revolution, Khomeini was assisted enormously by modern technology. And the ability, for example, to have video and audio tapes smuggled into Iran when he was in exile. If you look in India at the Hindu fundamentalist movement, you will find that it rose because of the, the, the introduction of television in India. I was in India in 1982-83 doing field work when television arrived in the area of India I work in, in time for the Asian Olympics. The government got televisions all over the place. But what happened shortly after that is that people started producing the Hindu epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, which are two very important Hindu texts. And all of a sudden, the entire nation was watching dramatizations of these epics on national television creating a sense of Hindu identity at a national level, which had never existed before. It had all very, been very local, but now television facilitated it. The same thing has happened with evangelical ministers in the United States, who are quite savvy at high-tech promotion of their cause. So there's this enlightenment picture, which I am fairly convinced is wrong, that just get technologies out there, and all of a sudden you promote this secular humanist internationalist vision of a global civilization, I think that technology has proved to be at least neutral with regard to the direction in which it's, uh, uh, direction of use to which it is put. It's also quite possible, of course, that even a genuinely successful, narrowly conceived global economy will not emerge or will fail to sustain itself or that efforts to expansively globalize values, beliefs, and cultural practices will be effectively resisted, in some cases for very good reasons, it's even possible that the world will go to war. And as I mentioned, that is how the last big push to globalize the world came to an end, with World War I. And of course, what really happened when the Berlin Wall went tumbling down in 1989 was that the boundaries of the former Soviet multinational empire began to dissolve. Just as other empires have from time to a time, over the course of history, splintered, fractured, or given up their sovereignty over one or more of the nations within their territorial realm. This happened to the Habsburg Empire, it happened to the Ottoman Empire, it happened to the British Empire. There's always this capacity to overexpand bankrupt yourself through expansion, lose the capacity to control, and have groups splinter off and 
seize the opportunity to create their own autonomy. autonomy. Um, so speaking both metaphorically and literally, the flattening of that particular barrier, the Iron Curtain, unleashed a process in which diverse ethnic, racial, and religious satellite and vassal regions under ethnic Russian hegemony, for example, the various nations in the Balkans and the former Yugoslavia, began to seek autonomy as self-governing ethno-national states. And in some instances, those ethno-national movements engaged in violent conflict to achieve their ends. The result, which amounted to the construction of new nation-state territorial boundaries defined by culture, ethnicity, language, religion, or race, was not entirely anticipated or properly understood, although given the role of the ethno-nationalist impulse in the historical formation of modern nation-states, all over modern Europe, Asia, and Africa, it should have been. Despite the popularity of the end of history predictions of the 1990s and the global project projection of a coming universal Western, more specifically American civilization, augury turned out to be a very hazardous business and the past 20 years have proved to be pretty baffling times. The ethno-national impulse is not necessarily pro-American. History has not come to an end, and ideological differences have not disappeared or converged on any single global standard. Instead, history seems to be repeating itself, although there's a debate about what precisely the recurrence might amount to. Hence, alongside the prediction of the rise of a universal civilization and the end of national differences, one actually finds the opposite prediction. That prediction is about the apotheosis of robust cultural pluralism and the triumph of the ethno-nationalist separatist project, not only in Europe, but on a global scale, with ideological differences expressed not just at the level of nation states, but also at the more macro level of regional civilizations. There's an historian, Jerry Mueller, who actually has argued that one of the reasons that there's been relative stability and lack of conflict in Europe since World War II is largely because those European nations succeeded at ethnically cleansing themselves. That the ethno-nationalist project had actually succeeded in Europe. That is, if you went back to the late 19th century, or early 20th century, you would have found that many European states were multicultural and had lots of diverse populations. If you look, for example, at the Austro-Hungarian Empire prior to its collapse, no language was spoken by more than 23% of the population. And that was German, but that was only 23% of the population. If you look at India today, for example, which is a very interesting example of a multi-ethnic society, there is no language in India that is spoken by a majority of the population. Hindi is probably the most populous, but it's not a majority. English, you know, most of us who meet, most people who meet Indians outside of India meet English-speaking Indians. But when I was in graduate school, probably no more than five to 10% of the population of India spoke English. And I don't have a good figure for today, but I'd be surprised if it was more than 20% who speak English in India today. So, in any case, Mueller argues that Europe became stable because they actually redrew boundaries and created ethno-national states. I use the expression ethno ethnic cleansing, not in the, only in the murderous sense, but in the, just in the sense of trying as best one can to um, homogenize one's population. To, you can do that by not letting in immigrants in the first place, that is having strict borders, you can do it by deportation. You can do it by having top-down educational systems which force assimilation to some standard cultural ideal. Or you can end up actually having genocide. But one way or another, and there was plenty of, 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 of those, all those processes went on in Europe for, for many decades. Uh, Mueller argues by the time you got to 1950, many of those European states were ethno-national states and it succeeded at becoming homogeneous. 
One could go further, by the way, and here is a paradox to puzzle over, but I've recently been involved with a number of scholars looking at the relationship between income inequality in a society and cultural diversity. And if you do this cross-nationally, what you discover is that those countries that have the greatest income equality have succeeded somehow in distributing wealth relatively equally are also the most homogeneous culturally. Almost as if the price of the economic income equality is homogenization of the culture or ethnic cleansing. Um, so Slovenia has a lot of, in, uh, are relatively equal in income. Georgia, the country, um, has relative income equality. Um, places like France and Germany, relatively more, homo more homogeneous than India or the United States or China, for example. And they also have more income equality. So there's some kind of trade-off going on. If you, if you value cultural diversity and you value income equality, having them both at the same time has been a very difficult thing to achieve. That's the point. In any case, um, there's this second prediction emerges, which is basically that what you're going to have in the world is an emergence of robust cultural pluralism, even at the level of regional civilizations. It's a model of a robust cultural plural international system devoid of any domestic multinationalism. In other words, cultural diversity across states or regions, but cultural homogeneity within states or regions. And not surprisingly, ethno-nationalists of all stripes love this image of the New World Order. In the 1970s, I had a Sudanese student who did his PhD thesis on attitudes towards modernization among African graduate students at the University of Chicago. He used a beliefs and values questionnaire, which was popular at the time. It was inspired by the sociologist Alex Inglis, who was studying modernization. And what my Sudanese student discovered was that among the African students, the materialism factor was independent of the individualism factor. In other words, one could value wealth accumulation without giving up one's primordial attachments or commitments and loyalty to the tribe. What happened? Well, the Saudi Arabian ruling elite liked that message so much they hired this student immediately to teach in their universities. Um, <laughs> perhaps that's why Samuel Huntington's thesis that the West is unique but not universal and that other nations and civilizations do not need to become Americans to benefit from globalization and the technologies of the modern world is so popular in many parts of the non-Western world. I think we have to take the second prophecy very seriously, especially with regard to its expectation that globalization and human betterment can and will occur without the necessity of a deep penetration of cultural heritages from the West across the whole globe. Nevertheless, by the light of this vision, diverse national communities and even whole civilizations are encouraged to remain domestically mononational so as to preserve their distinctive traditions while everyone gets a piece of the economic pie. It's an ideal of when in Rome do as the Romans do and separate but equal on a global scale. Um, in any case, uh, if, you've, if you're familiar with Samuel Huntington's work, one of the things that I think is distinctive of his position is that Samuel Huntington is a robust cultural pluralist internationally. He says, okay, there are these big six civilizations. They've been around a long time. I expect them to continue to be around. The, you know, my civilization, this is Huntington, would be, I'm using, I'm taking his perspective. My civilization the ang it has an Anglo-Saxon origin. It's my Western civilization. It's unique. I don't expect that it is a light onto others necessarily. But let me have it. 
this is my civilization, and therefore Huntington gets very anxious about immigrants who don't buy into the common standard of the civilization that he views as his own. And he <coughs> therefore is pretty much anti-immigration. He's been very critical of Mexican immigration into the United States, for example. So he's a kind of domestic ethno-nationalist, while at the same time not being an imperialist. Okay? He's perfectly prepared to have global diversity of culture and robust cultural diversity. Okay. So those are the two first two predictions. I'm very briefly going to talk about the third, just to have time for questions, and because I realize I'm running a little long here. Um, but, the, uh, and of course, that's too bad, because the third prediction is the one I'm placing my bet on, but I'll give you a, bit, a sketch of it. The, the, uh, but in any case, the first prediction then is universal civilization West is best, it comes closest to realizing the objective moral charter, and eventually it will succeed. And if we can just liberate people around the world from autocrats and top-down control systems, they've just been waiting to become Americans too, if only given the chance. Um, the second prediction says, no, no, quite the contrary. Not only is there not going to be a universal global civilization, but in fact, Cultural identities are so deep that every cultural group wants a state of its own. And they want that state to work to perpetuate their way of life, their practices, and therefore the ethno-national impulse will succeed in creating lots of essentially balkanized monocultural entities who will have strict boundaries with regard to cultural input through immigration or refugee status and certainly are gonna have strong top-down assimilation programs requiring people to get with whatever the cultural program is in that particular state. Okay. France, today, criminalizing wearing burqas in public spaces, not allowing headscarves in schools. Things of this type are just indicate The vote in Switzerland to prohibit the building of minarets in Switzerland. All these are kind of ethno-national reactions against diversity of one type or another. Well, the third and final prophecy concerning the shape of the new world order goes something like this. Jerry Mueller, who I mentioned, also makes an interesting observation that for most of human history, people actually lived in empires, not in ethno-national states. So you think about all those empires I mentioned, the Habsburg, the Ottoman, the British, but you can name dozens and dozens of empires around the world. And one of the characteristics of those empires, I'm going to use the Ottoman as a model, for example, um, is that you had a weak, I'm not talking about the Ottoman Empire when you had marauding horsemen marching into other people's territories. Nor am I talking about the Ottoman in the last days of the Ottoman Empire, or, you know, just around World War I and beyond that, when it was breaking up, when ethno-national movements were breaking off pieces of territory, and when it had accumulated an enormous national debt. The French basically owned the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century. Um, but I'm talking about a period just before that, when you had 22 different peoples living within the Ottoman Empire. 22 different peoples coexisted. Bulgars, Turks, Jews, Saudis, on and on and on, lived in this, in this, in this land. And the Ottomans essentially had a fairly weak central states, central government. They basically collected taxes, and they tried to enforce a rule that each group stayed in its own, what they called millet, their own local territory, but they handed over in a decentralized, almost federal way, control to local elites. So there was no common family type in the Ottoman Empire. There was no one religion in the Ottoman Empire. There was no one anything in the Ottoman Empire, because local cultural traditions figured out a way to live and let live 22 different people without, and if there were rules, it was don't encroach, uh, go across into other people's boundaries, and exit visas should be available if you don't like where you're living. 
And so you had these urban centers that grew up like Damascus, like Cairo, like Baghdad, where if you were a kind of cosmopolitan type who didn't like your own cultural tradition, you could go there and be in a very mixed setting where there was probably a great deal of creativity and so forth. But they coexisted that way. So I'm imagining that what's actually happening is that the world is moving back to something like the Ottoman Empire, or an empire, except it's a global empire now. And you have global institutions which are emerging, like the World Trade Organization, like the United Nations, like um, the World Bank, those organizations are manned by the personnel of those organizations come from all over the world. They basically are people who are educated at Peking University and the University of Chicago and the other places and have a picture of a world system. And they're there essentially to try to coordinate that part which is going to integrate exchanges and contact between people. Um, and then you're going to have people who live in these millets on a global scale and are trying to promote thick ethnicity, their own way of life is important to them and they want to reproduce it and perpetuate it. And the challenge before us is how are the local elites going to think about this robust cultural pluralism? Are they going to assume a kind of restrictive notion of globalization which like George Washington and Haim Solomon, leaves liberty for people to develop their own preferences, cultural traditions, family lives, enforce certain minimal rules about non-encroachment or aggression into other people's territories, about exit visas being available for people who want to exit from wherever they are, or are they going to pick up universalizing agendas, even if they're under the name of human rights or social justice, which basically are attempts to impose one cultural tradition's view on the rest of the world. I think that both of those tendencies are going to be, be there, but as a robust cultural pluralist, I actually believe that those more universalizing imperial cultural projects will not succeed. They will just produce resentment, kickback, rebellion, and ultimately wise members of the global elite manning the world system aspects of the empire are going to learn that lesson and pull back from that attempt at cultural imperialism. Um, that's my bet. There are the three prophecies. I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much.